Am I on? On? Ooh, yes. Hi, welcome. I know it's Friday after lunch. I'm trying to stay awake myself. I apologize if my voice is a little bit... Going out to a karaoke bar the evening before you give a talk is not a good idea. <laughs> so, um, thank you for having me. Um, so, my name is Mikey, and I am having trouble with my clicker. So, I'm a technical writer for Red Hat. Um, I've been a technical writer for almost seven years now. Um, I document OpenStack. I, uh, before that, I documented JBoss. Um, I've also been involved with Feed Henry. I am a Scrum Master. Uh, don't hold it against me. There are advantages in that. Um, in my ever-decreasing spare time, um, I run uh, the European chapter, I guess, of uh, Write the Docs, which is a documentation community. Um, I talk about docs in developer conferences, like this one. And I also organize Django Girls workshops, like we did here in the beginning of the week. Um, I also coach uh, developers and open source projects on documentation. So we actually had a help desk with a couple of my esteemed colleagues uh, on Wednesday, where we, into, we had people coming in and getting some advice on their open source project documentation. Um, and uh, yeah, so I don't sleep very much. <laughs> Uh, I'm based in Brno, Czech Republic, so it kind of makes it easier to get around. Um, so why am I here? Um, why do they put me in this gigantic room <laughs> um, and uh, brought me all the way over here to your Python? Because apparently some people think that documentation is important, um, and it's important to me. Obviously, it's my job. Uh, otherwise, you know, if I didn't care, I wouldn't be doing this for a living. Uh, but it also, if you don't do this for a living, you know, our users are the ones who have to use your software, right? So um, they care about it because it helps them get a better experience. It, you know, the people who create the software, it also helps them because they get to uh, be able to showcase what the software can do. Um, and for the organizations, for the communities. Um, so um, it used to be, and it still is to varying degrees, right? So like um, documentation has kind of been a thing that happens to other people, um, or it just kind of happens magically. Um, but uh, thankfully, I, this thing is a bit finicky. Uh, so thankfully, there's been a shift uh, over the last years, uh, last few years, where people understand um, that your content that accompanies your software is basically a part of the whole package. Right? So you have your software, you create it, you test it, you support it, you document it, and then you deliver it to your users. Um, so how do we help the success of a software project? Right? Uh, first of all, how many people here write documentation for a living or as a, you know, in a, in a project or something like that on a regular basis? Hey, it's not bad. Cool. I was wondering where everybody was. <laughs> um, so, um, there's a, kind of, there's a lot of different ways of breaking down uh, how things can help, how documentation can help you. Uh, but mainly it's, you know, you want to improve the user experience. Um, so, it, you know, content, any kind of content, it could be your user guide, it could be a readme, it could be UI strings or an error message, right? All of these things are pros that accompanies your code, right? So, the, um, so not only that, but you want to create um, a portable and adoptable workflow for how to actually create and use your product, right? So if you have internal processes in your, uh, in your uh, project or in your company, um, you want to be able to train people that you've never met in person, right? So it's, you know, the easiest thing to do is to sit down with someone and be like, okay, this is how you use this, you know, this software or this library or whatever it is, right? But you want to be able to create something scalable and to create something scalable in today's world, you gotta be able to give people some text, right? You mean giving a presentation, you know, going to events, like, you know, doing some, I don't know, consulting in a company or something like that. Th those are great, but like, you want to be able to reach the people that you can't do in person. Um, so join the Docs Club. Uh, how do we get there? Um, I've broken this thing down um, to the three sort of uh, themes that from my experience, um, make it, like, you, you can do uh, a lot with not a whole lot of initial investment. Like, you can do this effectively, right? You don't have to just, you know, if you're a developer, you don't have to, you know, retrain as a technical writer and, you know, spend tons and tons of time learning. Just a second. Um, 
So there's a lot of things that you can do pretty effectively. Um, so the first thing that I'm gonna talk about is content strategy. And content strategy is actually like a marketing web development term that's being slowly applied to the field of technical documentation. And um, it's basically about asking the right questions before uh, you document something, right? So I'm gonna n not be original here. I'm just gonna use the five W's because that's what everybody knows. You know, it's a very sort of global way of grouping it. So the first thing I wanna know is who are my readers, right? So, you know, if we're talking about things like personas, do I, I'm, not, I'm referring to end users, developers, administrators, uh, business analysts, whatever, right? You can also divide the users according to skill level. So is this project, is this software going to be used by absolute beginners? Um, is this something that, um, you know, a very, very specialized API used by people who are already uh, very, very experienced? You know, like, I'm not talking about Uber nerds and, you know, who are the people that I'm writing this content to, right? So this is also an indication of who your software users are, right? So. Um, you can also do, uh, you can also break down the users according to geo, um, you know, some, uh, you know, and you talk, you talk comparing like the Americas versus Europe versus uh, Asia Pacific, you know, different people need different things. Um, and so the next question is, what do they want to know, right? So for example, if I'm writing a Django Girls tutorial, right, uh, I don't really need to give them the entire history of Python and Django and like just get them into deep dive, right? You wanna get them the information, just enough information that they need, right? So if they want to get started learning about, uh, about Django via the Django Girls tutorial, what sort of information do they need? So I will create a tutorial with a very, very uh, slim down version um, to be able to be digested uh, more easily, right? So if I'm documenting let's say, uh, a very complicated deployment like uh, of, of you know, service-based architecture or something like OpenStack or, you know, so there's a different level of information that they need. Um, so, and then the next question is, when do they need it, right? So when I say when, it's not necessarily like uh, what time of day or, you know, whatever, but it's in the, if you look at the life cycle of the usage of your, of your software, right? So if we're talking about Django Girls as an example, I'm an absolute beginner, I've never used this thing before, right? Or if let's say we had somebody in the help desk that came in and had a documentation structured um, at cross purposes, right? So you want to, if people come into your project for the first time, you want to give them a bit of background um, about what this project is for, what they can use it, why would they want to use it, right? So this is the beginning. And then when they can start, when they get started, and then they start using the software, then you can give them more common tasks. Let's say, like, if I want to do some administration, some configuration, you know, and then later on, if they get into trouble, right? Like, what sort of, uh, when do they get to your content? When are they going to need this? Um, and then the next question is, of course, where? So when I was talking about things like error messages, right? Error messages are basically just another form of content, right? And a well-phrased and informative error message is better than a 10 or 100 page troubleshooting guide, right? Because if I can give the information right when the problem occurs, then I've saved the user a lot of frustration and I've made their user experience better. Right, so if you're having, if you're creating a command line tool, you know, and you just want to go man this, you know, this is right there in the terminal, so this is aware. Um, and also, you know, people will naturally, uh, after they've tried everything, right, they'll naturally revert to Google, right? So how do I make uh, uh, my content available and accessible online, for example, or, uh, or do I want to do it in a PDF for some reason? Um, but, I mean, PDFs are still important. Um, so, um, these are the, st I'm just kind of throwing a lot of questions because I'm not actually going to answer all of them because there's so many different ways of looking at it. So, um, and then the last question is why, right? Like, why do I care? Why are you showing this content to me? How is it going to fix my problem? I was having this discussion a couple of days ago uh, with someone who said that bad documentation 
is just as bad as no documentation. And I actually think, this is of course my opinion, that bad documentation is worse than no documentation because if I'm a user and I got into a problem, I need to find something in the documentation, there is no documentation, right? This sucks, right? Like, but I realize that this sucks within like maybe a few minutes. And then if there is a bunch of documentation and it's wrong, then I'm gonna read the whole thing. And it's gonna take me like, I don't know, 10, 20, 15 minutes. And then I'm gonna get even more frustrated. So why am I writing this? Like, what am I solving here, right? I mean, why, so, so for example, if we're writing, um, uh, what was it? An installation guide, you wanna get your, all of your prerequisites, you wanna find out the information. And then if you deploy it, uh, then you need to know where you can go next as well, right? So this is the kind of question that actually puts all the previous questions to a test. And sometimes it uncovers a different problem, right? So if I have to write a big, big document that, uh, for troubleshooting and for FAQ, and it turns out that I'm just really documenting bugs, maybe we wanna consider fixing the bugs so that we don't have to just stick it in the release notes Right, so this is a tricky one, but it's very, very important. So now I'm gonna give a couple of examples. Um, I wish I could give more examples, but there's just like so many. <laughs> and I could just sit and talk about this all day. Um, so the first example I wanna talk about is user or role-based uh, breakdown of content. And this is the GNOME help, we all know it. Um, and what I love about it is the first thing that you see when you go into the GNOME help, help.gnomeproject.org, uh, other than the fact that you see a bug, or I see a bug. Can anybody see this bug? I wonder if you can see this bug. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> I don't know, I just, I was looking for it and I'm like, hey, wait a minute, there's a problem. So you have users, uh, administrators, and theoretically you're supposed to have developers here, right? So I need to file an issue for that. Um, so the first thing that you see is, Gnome asks you, who are you? I should put a Alice in Wonderland caterpillar meme here. Um, so who are you, right? Um, and then if I'm a user, I click on users, and then I go to a browsable sort of categorized um, uh, library, All right, okay? And according to what, the thi what t type of activities I'm doing in the desktop, right? So it gives me the information that I am most likely to look for as, as a user. Um, and if I'm an administrator, then these are basically the administrator only or the administrator specific uh, uh, documents that I need. So I don't need to worry about how to you know, configure my email or install a new uh, software through the software collections or something like that. Like this is the thing that A, will confuse users and if I throw all that other stuff in there, the administrators will be like, just, just give me what I need, right? Um, and then you have the developers, we have the development center, you have the APIs, you have the platform demos. So this is a really nice example of how to use persona-based or role-based uh, uh, information delivery. Um, so the Arch Linux wiki, I'm assuming most people here know what it is. Um, what I like about showing it as an example is that everybody raves about this wiki. And I've been hearing about this since I started going to events. Um, and at first glance, it looks like a mess. Right? And I'm thinking to myself, why? Right? Because, I mean, I don't use Arch Linux and, you know, I'm still like uh, trying, I'm in the Linux user in training. But, um, so I'm looking at this thing and I'm going, why does everybody love this so much? And then I realize the only thing they care about is this. <laughs> right? Because, and then I realize this, by the time that I get as an Arch Linux user, by the time I get to this wiki, I've already tried everything I could possibly think of myself. Right? Um, and I've tried Google, whatever. So I go to this thing already f knowing what I want more or less, or at least have a few keywords in mind. And a wiki doesn't have to be browsable, right? A wiki base is not meant to be hierarchically uh, structured, right? So it's pretty flat. Uh, and anyone who, you know, tries to manage their documentation uh, for a more broad um, open source project, like, I don't know, Fedora, Kitty, you know, those kind of things. Um, it's tricky, right, when you're trying to address a more broad audience, but I only care about this. I wanna find what I want, and I wanna find it fast. Um, yeah, so now I'm gonna give a, an example of, uh, uh, of structure and conciseness. 
Um, so uh, one of the things that we're working on, and this is, this, I, I love Red Hat, because we always have a very kind of humoristic self-reflection uh, attitude. Um, so in OpenStack, uh, all our documentation is available uh, publicly on the customer portal. So if you see here, it starts off like, okay, I have like every, you know, every link here is, is a different guide. Um, and then you have the release notes. But then, you know, you're starting to get a little bit more complicated, a little bit messy. And you do like, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, like seven upgrading guides. And then the getting started section is so long, I couldn't screen capture it. And I'm like, where, where, where do I go, right? So this is actually something that we're working on. <laughs> so we are at the moment, as we speak, you know, reviewing everything we have, right? So it doesn't really matter if you're just starting with your project, with your software project, or if you've been doing this for a very long time, right? There's always something to improve and there's always, uh, there's, it's never too late to also look back and improve what you have. And we're actually, to fix this, we don't have to change any of the content of the guides, right? All we have to do is look at what these guides are talking about, how do we break them down, and just sort of dump everything in one pot and reorganize it. So we're working on it, and if you want to follow it, you can see when uh, the next version comes out at some point. Um, so the second thing I want to talk about and uh, um, is I wanted to use Doc Ops, but somebody trademarked it. Um, so this be it. Uh, so DevOps for Docs is a concept that uh, uh, we've been kind of kicking around uh, the documentation community for a little while. Um, and some of the things are, uh, some of these practices have been around for a very long time. Some of them are just starting to sort of come to light. But the basic concept of it is that we're borrowing uh, terms and practices, methodologies from the engineering world and applying them to documentation, right? So if like, if, you know, long gone are the days of a word processor to a printed PDF, right? Like we don't do that anymore uh, if we can help it because it's a lot, it's very restricting, right? So um, the first thing I want to talk about is the unified tool chain. Um, so, for example, we've had a lot of people come up to us and they helped us and go like, you know, which tools or which markup languages, uh, which publication tools should I use? And the first thing I ask is, what's your language? What's your technology, right? And like, so if it's Python, if it's Ruby, if it's whatever, right? So, like, in order to make the most out of the documentation tooling, we turn to the engineers, we turn to the developers, and we see, what do you use? You know, how do we integrate? the documentation, authoring, and publication into uh, the development cycle, right? So it makes it easier. It makes it easier because you can just add a documentation string in the code, and then you can auto-doc it, right? Or you can Java doc it, or whatever it is you want. You know, there's so many tools out there that can just hook into your code and extract some documentation. You know, and not just that. I mean, you have, like, uh, uh, GitHub uses GitHub to document GitHub. Like, there's, there, it's an, uh, there's a talk about it in Write the Docs Portland. Um, so to be able to kind of dog food your own uh, engineering tools. Um, so also things like issue tracking, you know, to be able to uh, get a documentation type issue in your Bugzilla, right? Or, uh, or Jira or whatever it is. Just using the same platform to track uh, uh, documentation tasks uh, saves a lot. You know, because I mean, otherwise people are just like, oh, I'll send them an email, I'll see if we can review it or whatever. So what we do at Red Hat, we have a lot of, um, every product has whatever tracking platform for issues, and we have our own documentation projects for some of them. And so our engineers or our users, they can open issues for us, right? So I mean, for open source projects, it's a lot easier because most of the time it's all in the same place. But I mean, in the enterprise world, it's a really big deal. <laughs> um, so, um, and then we have things like, continuous integration. So every time you, you know, make a commit and uh, rebuild the library, it checks for, you know, you can check for broken links, you can check for, you know, sanity, all these different things. Um, and iterative authoring, um, like I said, I used to be a scrum master. I'm probably never going to stop being a scrum master entirely. So it's always gonna kind of accompany me wherever it is I go. And I just, I hate looking at a giant pile of tasks. Um, I'd rather break things down into more manageable chunks. Uh, and this is also another uh, thing is if you have iterations in your 
uh, coding, then integrate your documentation into that. So like, I mean, if whether you're working like Sprint plus one uh, or, or making a documentation of a feature actually a requirement to deliver this feature, right? I mean, I know that mo I, I've, I've been hearing more and more about uh, projects that um, really do implement peer review uh, for, doc for the content as well as the code. Not that many yet, uh, but hopefully, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, if you can increase the engagement of the community in the project, um, that things like that can actually help, right? So this is, I'm talking more of like, more of infrastructure and the tooling that uh, they can be involved in there. So content curation, uh, or as we call it, some call it sharpening your X. Um, so um, when I went to, um, I did a sorry. I did a documentation sprint uh, with Nick, Nick Soas, and I went into their documentation library, which basically they had like four guides. Each guide was like one giant file, XML, and like with it was just it was it was scary for me. And I've been writing and uh, authoring in XML for like you know six years, uh, so I can't imagine like if somebody wants to contribute something to it, then they'll just you know they'll just drop the computer and run away screaming. So like things like uh, so what we did is I I broke down this gigantic XML file into topics and files, and I just organized it in a hierarchical way. And so if people want to contribute, then th the source files were curated in a way that's more modular, right? So if you go to the NixOS documentation on GitHub, then you can see the four main guides uh, have that kind of structure. So you can move things around if you add new features, if you want to break it down, it's a lot more manageable. Um, and you have automation, uh, which I love. Uh, because I'm lazy. <laughs> so laziness is the mother of automation. Um, and when I say automation in a documentation context, I don't just mean like things like uh, continuous deployment, um, which is uh, more critical for the bigger sort of projects. Um, you know, if you just have a wiki base or, or a GitHub readme, then you have continuous deployment. Congratulations. <laughs> um, but things like automated testing for documentation, uh, and not just for code examples, because code examples can be tested with whatever it is that tests your code, right? So it's the same thing. But you have tools like Hemingway and Amender, and also a Sublime plugin, uh, from what I, um, I, I hear about more and more tools like that. They won't fix your grammar for you, but they'll tell you how, what you need to fix, right? So because we deal with pros, and not with code, there isn't, it isn't as straightforward as, you know, success, fail, build, right? So if I write a, a, a paragraph and it's really clumsy and long and has a lot of, like, it's in, inconcise and ambiguous, um, then you have all sorts of tools. Um, and I'm going to post uh, with the slides, I'm going to post a bunch of links because um, just I want to get through a lot of things. <laughs> um, so you have a lot of tools that can report things like, You've, you, you know, this sentence has a passive voice. Or um, if I write uh, the phrase, in order to, uh, you know, some tools will tell you. You don't have to use three words to say something you can say with one word, which is good because A, uh, you're not wearing your readers out by making them, you know, it's, it's, it's not a novel, right? Like you don't want to, you know, the point is to, it's a functional, it's functional English, right? Like, so it needs to serve a purpose. And the subtitle of this talk is Keep It Simple Present, and present simple is the sort of golden standard of technical documentation. So you can do this, you know? This window opens. You know, it's all very, very simple. And the reason for that is that you're, what you're talking about is more important than, you know, impressive writing uh, uh, expressions, right? So it's not an expressive language. Um, so these kind of tools, I would love to see more collaboration and more innovation around it. So if you can just Google uh, uh, the tools or follow the links that I will post, um, I think they're really cool and they could be integrated into a lot of different existing infrastructures. Um, okay, so, uh, and so the third thing that I wanna talk about um, is basically the community engagement and the contribution engagement and how do we make how do we make, how do we help the documentation improve by engaging the people that we work with to care, right? So in this context, um, we have seen 
that a lot of, uh, many times, you know, the people who uh, work on these open source projects are like, yeah, you know, I wrote this code, but I don't really have time to write documentation, but, you know, how do I, so what, one of the things that I do, uh, and um, some of my contemporaries do as well, is, you know, we go and we try to show that, A, it doesn't have to be such a tedious time investment, so even just a little bit of forethought, uh, things like asking the right questions, or just thinking a little bit about the infrastructure and how you're integrating into the development cycle, right? So all these different things, um, uh, outreach efforts uh, um, is one of the things that we do, that we can do. Um, so I'm just gonna give a few examples of the type of activities that you can do in order to uh, increase the engagement from a community or from a project from your contributors. Of course, this is not uh, conclusive and there is lots and lots of things that you can do, but these are kind of the things that I've personally and from talking to people I've seen uh, that had a, a good impact. So, um, of course, uh, you're welcome to experiment and explore. Um, so the contribution guidelines is things like when you want uh, somebody to contribute to documentation, how do they do it, right? So just like when you have uh, uh, how to contribute to uh, the code of a project, just if you invest a little bit of time in figuring out an, uh, an optimal contribution workflow or some sort of effective contribution workflow for your project, it's gonna be very helpful down the line. Um, so just as an example, um, we wrote this in like, I don't know, I think it took us less than half a day, like maybe like a few hours at most. Um, and it's like a one wiki page on how to contribute to the documentation. It has like, you know, what do I need to do, right? So here are the steps that I need to take in order to contribute to the documentation. They didn't have this, uh, and now they do, and I hope it helps, you know. I mean, I, it does. I mean, I've seen, I've been talking to them a little bit over the last few months. Um, but, um, so this type of investment that can be just a few hours, and you don't even have to collaborate on it, right? Like, if you just figured out how to contribute uh, or change something in the documentation of a project, write it down, <laughs> you know? And then it'll help others, and then you won't have to keep doing it yourself, right? So this is kind of, uh, this is kind of a, a, a preemptive delegation, I guess, or scalability. So another good uh, trick is to use templates and the template is worth a thousand words. I've seen here, um, one of the examples that I love that's used a lot is the read the docs read me template. Um, and I keep hearing about it, it's like, oh, this is a really, like I would literally go, this is a nice read me, where'd you get the template? It'd be like, here, you know? So even if you don't necessarily have a template, if you could just point out uh, a topic or a file for, uh, for one of your uh, pieces of documentation, that you think looks good and that the project agrees. Like, so last year at EuroPython, we were working on a plone readme, uh, and um, they basically are using that as a template for all of their other readmes. Um, so all we needed to do is to get something once looking right, and then you can use it, uh, you can reuse it and use it as a basis later. Um, so things like collaboration and training, you know, all these engagement, uh, so these are things that are obviously easier to do when you are in person. Um, so what we do, things like uh, sprints and hack fests for documentation. Um, so this is from last year's EuroPython, we did a Django Girls doc sprint. Um, and uh, uh, at, uh, was it? this is a DevConf, uh, they did a workshop about uh, Dev Assistant and Jenkins for docs. Um, so these are all activities, and that's from Flock to Fedora. Um, so these are all activities that are done in developer conferences, right? So going into the sort of more broad, general uh, open source tech community and really uh, helping to educate and coach and train and mentor, it, it, it helps. I mean, I've, I, I don't know, we had a help desk, for, it was supposed to be three hours and it ended up being four hours because we had so many people come in and, you know, uh, I, I love the fact that, that the open source community is so open to receive these things. But you know, if, if, if the writers uh, and, and developers, we can all get together and cross-train and share the knowledge. Uh, so these are good examples of how to do it. 
so even if you are not a writer, um, you have a, a sort of a, the newer generation of documentation conferences. So, I mean, uh, some people uh, probably might remember the Society of Technical Communication, the STC, um, which is kind of like your grandfather's conference. Um, and, but you have conferences like Write the Docs, like uh, Open Help, and you get sort of uh, pop-up or ad hoc documentation conferences as a part of uh, a bigger conference. So Open Help and Write the Docs are like uh, the two uh, most popular uh, uh, documentation community. So Open Help is more focused on sprints, uh, and Write the Docs is more about, uh, we have conferences, we have meetups as well, and the people who come to these events are not just writers. In fact, we probably have like maybe a third of our attendees that write the docs are writers, uh, and then the rest is you know split up between uh, split up between you know developers, sysadmins, community managers, uh, project managers. We got you know uh, 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 marketing people. Like you have everybody coming into the same space and talking about content, right? So. Um, we have a conference coming up next month in Prague. Uh, Open Help has uh, the next conference in uh, September. It's in Cincinnati. Um, and uh, so these are exactly the kind of places that a, I would feel at home as a writer. <laughs> and you know uh, anybody can enjoy because the developers can learn about how a writer thinks. You know, and these, you know, the, the, the project managers can learn how to integrate between the different roles. And everybody wants to improve the documentation in order to help the success and the adoption of the project, right? Because, I mean, everything is so, we have such a, a, a huge amount of information nowadays, and there are so many project, projects, so many technologies. How are you going to make it stand out? Right? So if the first thing that I see is your GitHub README, you better make it friendly. You know, like I, you don't want to, you don't want to lose me so early. And the README is a documentation as well. So whether you are a squirrel, a badger, a beetroot, or a capybara, you know, everybody can care about content. And you can care about it in your own way based on your own role. And you don't have to do it alone because there's, oh, you know, Hopefully, there's always going to be someone from a different role that you can collaborate with. Um, so, yeah. Questions? Thank you. And things. <coughs> We've got like seven minutes for questions. So, if anyone wants to ask, please. Keep your yeah. hand right. No. I'm, always, I'm also going to be hanging out afterwards. Uh, so, Hi, thank you very much for this great talk. Okay. Um, given that you are a Scrum Master, I was wondering if you have like iteration on your documentation as well. So if you bring, for example, the PO to, your, to you, basically, and make him approve or disapprove your documentation. Mm. OK, so what you're asking is, do we develop documentation and use the same stages as software development? Yeah, in a sense. So if you, if you do sprints on documentation, so will your product owner um, be at the review meeting and say, well, I don't really like this kind of uh, documentation on this specific feature, and you go to another iteration, in mm -hmm. a sense? Mm -hmm. OK, so that's, uh, that's a good question. I didn't actually focus on that so much, because um, it's more, I think, applicable to the, uh, the enterprise world rather than the, the sort of small project world. But for example, at Red Hat, we have content strategists uh, who basically act as product owners for the documentation. And just like you have um, uh, in a release meeting or release planning, you have the, you know, the engineering lead, the QA lead, the support, uh, uh, design, productization, et cetera. So now you have someone from documentation also in this mix. Right? And when we plan the content strategy for the next release, we collaborate with all of those people and we come up with a plan. And then the content strategist will pass it on to a documentation program manager, who's kind of like a tech lead. Right? So it would be like the engineering team lead, and they would distribute the work and b break it down into iterations or tasks. Now, specifically for iterations, um, so what we'll do is, uh, because the, doc the requirements, the tasks, come up to us already pretty much thought out, um, so we have a basis. 
However, <laughs> many times we are faced with, oh, you need to document this feature, and then by the time we get to document it, um, throughout the development of the feature, uh, it changed pretty drastically. So we have to do a lot of research. So before I actually go to document something, I will normally either contact the engineers who developed it or the QA engineers who tested it to see, I look at test plans, uh, I look at specs, I look at uh, blog posts. Uh, so I, was, I just had to document something and I'm like, oh, how am I gonna do this? And then the engineer's like, I wrote a blog post about it. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> you know, so these kind of things help. Write blog posts and then send them to your writers because we love that. Um, and then what we'll do is we have, uh, so this is, I'm talking for most of the companies that I've worked for so far, I've used a similar process. So we'll draft it, draft the content, send it out for uh, what we call a tech review or an SME review, uh, and then we'll send it out to a peer review with other writers. Um, so you kind of have like a two-step authentication on your docs before they get published. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Anyone else? Do you do s for public facing documentation? Well, do we what? For, so for general documentation, do you do stuff like A B testing to see if one way of doing it works better with the clients or people who use the API or something than the other? Ah, okay. Or even like any kind of analytics on the document? Sort of a. Uh, okay, so um, a lot of these practices are being implemented uh, to improve processes that didn't really work so well or that we can improve, right? So if we have, like for a company like Red Hat or a lot of the bigger companies that have different uh, products and a lot of the you know, stuff came in from acquisitions and some of it is upstream or whatever, so you can kind of test out uh, saying like, if I show you this document, um, uh, you can do that. But what, we'll, what we will do specifically now is we've implemented something called the closed loop program where we actually reach out to customers and we say, hey, give us some feedback on our documentation. Like, what do you like? What do you not like? Do you like the way that we construct these tutorials? Or, you know, do you want to see some architecture guide? You know, do you want to see more code, more deployment examples? You know, so we do communicate um, with our users and also with the communities because, you know, it's all kind of linked together, right? So for an open source project, your users are your contributors. Right, so, and most of the time from what I can see, they can be pretty vocal about what they like or not like, right? So you normally don't have to seek out feedback uh, from your users, because they will, they will tell you, <laughs> you know? But uh, yeah, it is, a, it is something that we try to implement as well. Um, I was just wondering, thank you for the talk, of course. It was very nice. Uh, <coughs> the, where is within, um, I guess in multiple organizations that you've done this, have you seen the organizational position of, of, of documentation and documentation writers change? Because um, for example, right now when I go and uh, look at the documentation for Google or any other uh, bigger company that want to promote a product, it's more in the marketing area of, mm -hmm. of things rather than for the people who like you know. Right. So it also depends. So thank you. So it also depends um, on who your audience is, right? So if I write for developer products, then I wouldn't necessarily uh, have it under the marketing organization. Uh, so for most of my experience, the technical writers have always been under the engineering organization. But um, about I don't know, like a year and a half ago or something like that, um, at Red Hat, we actually got moved to the customer experience and engagement organization. So we are in the same, th so this is the first time that the technical writing department or the organization is in the same place as people who deal, all the people who deal with the customers. So support and account managers. And so we've been moved from like hiding on, you know, behind, behind the engineers, you know, like uh, to actually being a more of a first class citizen. Um, and I know that, um, it depends on the organization. I can't really speak for things like Google or, um, or other companies because I don't really know what their org structure is. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky because uh, I've seen some uh, uh, technical documentation websites that have really more been just like a marketing spiel and then like you really gotta have that clear separation uh, because if, if the, the sort of, the more hardcore users are gonna get very disengaged if you try to, you know, 
sell them a bunch of, you know, give them a marketing spiel. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, okay. So this is the last question. Okay. Uh, I like it when <clears throat> the programmers write as much documentation as possible because it actually makes their code better. They, they think about it and they maybe change the code, but when is the time to move and hire a professional writer? Uh, <laughs> that's a really tricky question. So the, first of all, I perfectly agree that developers can write documentation for the uh, components or the software that they code to a certain point, right? So if you have a smaller project, um, it's, uh, that doesn't have, you know, so as, as long as, okay. I, I can't answer that because you have to see for yourself, like it's a case by case basis. But once you start having more than a few components that have to integrate uh, in order to create a solution, right? So once you move from just a piece of, of software to something more of a solution or a collection of services or components, then you start running into problems because most of the developers will focus on one component or two components. A, not a whole lot of integration coding uh, normally happens, right? I mean, I don't know, obviously, you know, I'm sure there's people who, in places who do that, but I haven't seen this personally. And one of the things that have an advantage of getting a professional uh, writer or someone who's, even take one of the developers who's more, uh, has a broader view. So if you're, if you live inside this component, it's gonna be very hard for you to think like a user, right? And as a developer, you're not being paid to think like a user. You're being paid to think like a developer, right? So like when we look at the whole scheme of things, you know, you don't have to worry about that because now you have a writer that can help you sort of group everything together. So I guess that's the closest thing that I can say to a recommendation. Um, you know, it'll be nice if you have one writer for every 10 or 15 developers. <laughs> Most of the time it's more like 20. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, this, I mean, that used to be the sort of guideline. Um, but I, 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 sorry if I couldn't answer your question more, you know, I don't have a magic formula. <laughs> so, but thank you. Well, uh, please thank Mer uh, Mikey for the talk and the amazing <laughs> questions.